Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, full of joy, full of hope, and full of love this morning. Today is January the 20th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, before we enter into our text this morning, as we're continuing our study through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to pick up in chapter 3 today, I want to remind you again, if you have not, be sure to pick up a copy of The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. Now, I just checked Amazon.com, and it's around $11.50, and that's a great price for what you're going to be getting on ChristianBook.com. It's $14.50. Now, of course, you'll probably get it quicker from Amazon, and it is cheaper, but I highly encourage you to pick up that book. We're going to be picking up that study in the coming weeks. Now, being titled The Spiritual Man, it's important that we understand that the Bible tells us there are many spirits in the world. There are many gods in the world, and this may come to a surprise to you, but there are many Jesuses in the world. In other words, men are presenting the person of Jesus in ways that are not true to Scripture. They're not true to the testimony that has been giving us. And so they are making God into the image they want him to be. They're making Jesus into the image they want him to be. And they're making the Holy Spirit into the image they want him to be. And when it tells us there are many spirits in the world, there are a lot of things that are going on in the world today that are being attributed to the Holy Spirit But as you will learn through this study, they're not the Holy Spirit at all. They are a spirit. The question is, what spirit? And so you probably noticed that I placed a video on our website that is titled Strange Fire Part 1. I highly encourage you, I strongly encourage you to watch these videos as I put them on each day. There are a total of around 17 or 18 of them, and we're going to watch all of these videos to prepare our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies for the truth that we're going to learn, meaning that we're going to lay a foundation before we actually jump into the book, The Spiritual Man. And it's important for you to lay this foundation for yourself so that you will have a full understanding of what is taking place You will be able to pray over this material and you'll open your heart to the truth of God and you'll not be disillusioned or misled by many of the things that are being held under the banner of Jesus but have nothing to do with the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit or His Holy Word. And these teachings, Strange Fire, are going to be presented to you through theologians through men who are well more studied than I and can articulate the message better than I. So again, I strongly encourage you to watch these videos. They are going to benefit you greatly. Once we complete those videos, then we'll step into our study of the spiritual man by Watchman Nee. And having laid that foundation, you will be better prepared for what it is we're going to both learn and to discuss. Well, with that being said, let's jump right into Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. And Paul begins by saying, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now, there are four letters written by Paul that he wrote while he was in prison. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And so Paul is addressing this letter to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, And he's recognizing that although he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ and he's there because of his message to the Gentiles, he wants them in verse 13 not to faint because he is suffering on their behalf, but he wants them to understand that as soldiers in the army of the Lord Jesus, 
when we take a stand in the position of the truth of God, that we too will be persecuted and we should accept that persecution with joy and triumph. Knowing as Jesus suffered, we're sharing in the same sufferings. And he says in verse three, that this mystery, that in verse five, throughout the ages was not made known unto the sons of men. It has been hidden. It has been kept secret, but it is now being revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit of God. And this mystery in verse six is that the Gentiles will be fellow heirs with the Jewish nation. They will become one body. There will no longer be a separation of Jew and Gentile, of bond or free, of slave or servant, of male or female, but all will be considered one in the same body and all will be one as partakers in the promise in Christ by the gospel of Christ. And Paul in verse seven was made a minister for this very reason. And yet, although Paul was chosen for this ministry, and he being the father of the ministry unto the Gentiles, he takes no pride in that, not even spiritual pride, but he says in verse eight that he is the least of all the saints, certainly the least of all the apostles. And he says this because he's reminded of the fact that at one time he was imprisoning and killing Christians, and he lived under the weight of that guilt But that guilt didn't hold him back from being all that God wanted him to be. It motivated him to make up for lost time. And so should it for us, friends. We should remember all the wasted time that we have had. And we should use all of our intellectual power, all of our physical effort to do today and in the days to come as the Lord blesses us with each day to make up for all those wasted days that lie behind us. And so he says, I seek to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth, all the hidden riches that lie within knowing him. And these riches aren't expressed in outward emotions, which is what many in the church have made it. These riches are expressed in the deep, quiet places when we sit still before the Lord. All of our attention is only upon him. We see his glory, his holiness, his majesty, and his truth, and we allow that to wash over us, conforming us into the image of Jesus. And we want to strive in verse 9 to make all men everywhere see the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, to the intent in verse 10 that all the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And this is according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is in Jesus that we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It's Jesus who empowers us to proclaim the message of the truth. And yes, we are to do this in patience. We are to do this in love. We ought to do this exercising compassion to the one who is hearing us. And although we are to speak graciously to them, we are never to soften the message. God hates sin. All sin, all sinners will experience his full wrath. And our only intention is to save as many from the fire as we can. And it is for this cause that like Paul, so should we bow our knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and that he would grant to each of us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in our inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, and we will be rooted and grounded in love. We will be rooted and grounded in God. Jesus said, there's coming a day when those who worship him will not worship him on the mountain or in the temple, but will worship him in spirit and truth because God is a spirit. John told us in his first letter, chapter four, that God is love. 
Well, God is love. God is a spirit. God is the spirit of love. And to be baptized in his spirit, to be filled with his spirit, to walk in his spirit means that we walk in love. And that's what verse 17 says. We are to be rooted and grounded in love. And if you want a definition of love, read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and focus on the one little passage that says love never fails. Love is not impatient. Love is not unkind. Love does not seek its own. Love is not proud. Love is not boastful. Love never fails. And he wants us to be rooted and grounded in a love which never fails. And as we become more knowledgeable of this love, as we experience more of this love, we are able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, dimension one, the length, dimension two, depth, dimension three, and height, four dimensions of love. And there are probably more, but we are to experience the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of God, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It passes human experience. It passes human expectation. And we are to be filled with all the fullness of God, all the love of God. God is love. That is his fullness. And it is God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Well, the context is the love of God. So what we should be asking for is that God would fill us with his love. Not for a better job, not for more money, not for more toys, but that we'll have the fruit of the Spirit evidenced in our life. Love, joy, kindness, gentleness, peace, meekness, long-suffering, patience. For this is according to the power that works in us. Well, what is the power that works in us? It is his Holy Spirit. His Spirit no longer resides in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. His, his Spirit resides in us. And his Spirit is the Spirit of love. A love that will cause us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love our neighbor above and beyond ourselves. And it's for this reason that all glory, all honor, all praise in, through, and by the church in Jesus Christ throughout all the ages, from this world till time without end, that Jesus Christ receive all praise, all glory, and all honor. Hallelujah. And as we begin to fully comprehend this, chapter 4, verse 1, we will begin to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called, with all lowliness, all meekness, all longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because love guides us, love fills us, love controls us, and love is the perfect representation of His Spirit. And this is why we are told not to walk in the flesh according to the flesh, but to walk in the spirit according to the spirit. And if it is the spirit that you are seeking, friend, the deep depth, fullness of the spirit, you'll not find it through physical manifestations. The spirit reveals himself to you through the inner working of the heart, conforming us into the likeness into the nature, into the person of the Lord Jesus, our master, who is the perfect representation of love. Oh, friends, I, I trust and pray that these words are bubbling up within you, that they are opening your eyes to the deeper truths of God. And that you, as we are told again in chapter 4, verse 1, will walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called by the Almighty. That you will walk with all lowliness, all meekness, all longsuffering. That you will forbear one another in love. 
You will be patient with one another. You will look over the faults of one another. And you will strive and endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, I pray that your journey will be blessed today, friends. I pray that the Lord Jesus will fill your heart with praise and he will guide you into new opportunities where you can both love him and you can love others. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.